We are really glad that you are here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you uh, uh, gave a part of your time to be with us this morning. And more than anything else at Lightbridge, what we want you to discover is that overwhelming, reckless love of God that chases us down, desires for us to connect with Him. And so we're uh, glad you're here this morning, and I hope today is a great reminder of uh, God's uh, grace and love. Uh, Matt kicked off our series last week, Insomnia, and did a great job talking about big dreams. And insomnia, what's keeping us us awake at night. And as he was talking about big dreams, uh, one of my favorite things that's happening right now is when Matt and I are at lunch together and he is telling me the dreams he has for our church and our community and helping people discover grace and I love listening to his energy and leaning into that. And we get a great privilege to be a part of that. And this week, I'm going to be talking about the things we can't fix. Because I don't know how it works for you, but most of the stuff that keeps me awake at night is like the stuff that's somehow beyond my ability to resolve or to take care of. And so what do we do? We're, we're laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, and we start getting anxious about things. We start worrying about things. And almost all of those things are at some level out of my control. I, I can't somehow do what I know how to do, which is solve a problem, fix something. And so we end up laying awake and then what happens to us that hole seems to get a little deeper and a little darker and all of a sudden we end up in a really really tough spot and maybe we end up praying this prayer uh, from David out of the Psalms he says this help God the bottom has fallen out of my life hear my cry for help and here's what I know to be true and across our campuses and across uh, our services, there's always some of us in the room who that's our prayer right now. That's our feeling. We are stuck. We feel like we're in a pit somewhere and we don't see a way out. We're not sure how we're going to fix this thing. And so I'm going to take just a moment for those of us in the room that are in that spot. And I just want to pray and ask God uh, to uh, bring some light into that dark place for us. Let's pray together. Father, just thank you for uh, the reminder we get from Scripture to lean into you. And yet so often, so often, our stuff that, uh, that we get anxious over, the stuff that can't be resolved, uh, Lord, those things in our lives that are tough for us, uh, we end up uh, worrying about. We end up getting concerned for. And so, Lord, right now, if we're in that spot, if, if that's where we are, we've been laying uh, in bed at night staring at the ceiling, Lord, I pray that you'd bring some grace and peace and light into our lives. And Lord, help us to invite you into the middle of those things. And whatever that issue is or issues are, Father, for us, whatever they might be, that, that we would look for you to be at work. And Father, we just, we just need you to pull us out of that dark place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you are uh, not new to LifeBridge, you recognize I am fighting something. Uh, and uh, I went to urgent care yesterday, and basically they said, just suck it up. And so uh, if I start coughing, I have two suggestions for you. I'm going to work to turn. And second, if you're down here near the front, watch out, because I may huck a loogie at you. So uh, uh, it's, well, it's just going. I've lost my voice a couple times last hour. So, uh, and I know how it happened. Uh, last weekend, Diana and I had the privilege of uh, taking our oldest granddaughter, Addie. She just turned 10. And a couple of years ago, we said to our uh, kids, our older grandkids, when you turn 10, we want to take you on a trip, and you get to help plan the trip where you want to go. And uh, so we've been saving up money for this and, and uh, grateful for uh, hotel points and airline miles and all those things that enabled us to do this. And she wanted to go down to Orlando to Discovery Cove. So last weekend, uh, we took her down. She wanted to swim with the dolphins, and, and, uh, and we were there. And, and the first morning, we, the hotel set us up we were at, and we did a chocolate. We made chocolates, and that was just awesome. We just had a great time with her. And then we ended up going to uh, some of the amusement parks down there. We went to SeaWorld, and she, she loves roller coasters. And if you were here a few weeks ago, I told you how much I hate roller coasters. I mean, I don't like it. And Diane does that wimp out thing. Oh, I get dizzy. And so I'm, and she's 10. And it wouldn't be great for us to have come home this trip without her. And so I ended up having to uh, get on these rides with her. And, and I mean, and she is like, you know, look, she's like all calm. I'm screaming. And, and, uh, <clears throat> 
And at SeaWorld, they have three of these massive roller coasters. One of them is you climb up uh, 200 feet, and then you dive down 73 miles an hour. They actually harness you in because you, you end up coming out of your seat. And, uh, and we're getting ready to get on that ride for our first time. And there's a guy I could watch in the ride in front of me, right? And, and I watch him, and he's coughing and hacking, and he's grabbed a hold of the handlebar things. And I'm thinking, I ain't touching any of that thing. But then when we went over the top of that thing, I was hanging on for dear life. I mean, I'm rubbing all the, I mean, I'm getting all the snot and everything off that thing. And then, since for, we rode those three roller coasters 13 times. 13. And because I screamed on most, I was breathing all the junk of all the people screaming in front of me. So I know why I got this stuff. And, and, uh, and, but the cool part of our trip actually was that uh, last Sunday morning, uh, we, uh, before we came home, we got to spend some time with her and uh, tell her what we see in her already uh, that we admire and uh, regard and what we hope for her life. And we got to pray with her, bless her, and gave her a scripture. And, and, uh, and, and I'm uh, grateful for that moment we had because why? When I worry about stuff, what are, what are the big four things we worry about? As adults, we worry about our relationships, family, right? We worry about our health, we worry about finances, and we worry about our work. And when I think about what, what my grandkids have coming, all the stuff facing them, you know, we wanted to be a positive sport, uh, force and speak into our life uh, about all the good things. Because we could have easily sat down and said uh, to her, you know, hey, uh, you know, honey, you're 10, and let me gonna tell you what's going to happen. There's going to be some guys that are going to break your heart. You're going to try out from support, some sports teams, you're not going to make them. You're, you're going to run out of money on some days, you know. Your parents are going to be jerks at times, you know. Do you know why grandparents and grandparents get along, by the way? They have a common enemy. Uh, that's, why, that's why they get along so well. You know, the reality is there's a lot of stuff coming. And what Diane and I wanted to do was just speak into her life and encourage her and uh, bless her. Because there's a lot, there's a lot that we end up worrying about. So here's the audience participation part. Have you ever worried about anything? Raise your hand if you have. Hey, how's that happen? Worry happens to us. We start getting there. We, we lay in bed and then we start thinking of scenarios and then we start making it worse and it gets worse and worse, worse. And all of a sudden we're looking down the road and we realize, <coughs> and there's stuff to worry about. Hey, this weekend, I'll shake everybody's hand. <laughs> I am good. And if you want a hug, come on. I'm, I'm in on that this weekend. Listen to Jesus' words. Right in the middle of the longest teaching we have from Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, it's early in the book of Matthew. Matthew, the first book of, your New, of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Jesus has this long teaching. And right in the middle, here's what he says. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat or drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more important than clothes? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? So Jesus is talking about all this stuff, and then right in the middle, he stops and says, hey, yo, don't worry about your life. Well, what else are you supposed to worry about? I mean, because your life is your stuff, right? It's your family, your relationships, it's your job, it's your money, it's, it's how you're going to take care of things. It's, it's all of those things. And we do worry. And right here, Jesus is saying, hey, don't worry. Now, what is Jesus trying to help us capture? What's he trying to, what's the point he's trying to catch? And here's what I believe it is, because as you go through the whole Sermon on the Mount, he kind of keeps hitting at this same thing. Hey, when you are trying to do life on your own, in your own ability, in your own resource, in your own power, in your own way to manage stuff, when you're doing life like that, let me tell you what, you got a lot to worry about. You got a lot. Because the reality, there isn't any of us in the room that have the capability to be exempt from difficulty or things that are beyond our ability to fix. We got stuff. 
And if you're independent, and I'm wired to be independent, and I want to I be a problem solver, and I want to maneuver and manage and manipulate and get things to work out the way I hope and need them to, but the reality is there's plenty of stuff in my life that, that I can't do that for. I, it is beyond my ability. And so what do I do? I lay in bed. And I, and I work it over, right? And then I start making stuff up that isn't even there yet. And I start, I start and now, now that problem leads to another problem. And if what if that happens? And this is going to happen. And, and all of a sudden, our worry gets way more toward anxiety. And if we're not careful, our anxiety pushes us into this dark hole of this ugly sister depression. 40 million American adults in the U.S. have been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. And that's just scratching the surface, really. The truth is, there is a lot to worry about today. We watch what's happening with politics. We see what's going on with finances. We watch how the Kentucky Derby worked out yesterday. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that we worry about. And here's what Jesus is saying. When you are doing life independent of God, when you are doing it in your own resource and in your own power and in your own strength and in your own ability, you do have a lot to worry about. But Jesus goes on to say, but if you get things kind of sorted with God, if you get him in your life, seek first his righteousness in his kingdom and all of this other stuff, Jesus said, will get sorted for you. The priority will get figured out, how it ought to be at work in your life, how it's going to play out. Those things will get sorted for you. And God is inviting us to be dependent, to trust him, and that's hard for us. The Apostle Paul, who was one incredibly independent person, comes to know Christ, and then he has these words to say after he'd experienced a boatload of trouble in his life. He says in Philippians chapter 4, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, don't worry about anything. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Man, what is up with these guys? Because the reality is there's a lot of stuff. But look what Paul turns us to. Don't be anxious, but present your request to God, And then the peace of God, and if there's a verse you ought to highlight or underline in your Bible, on your phone, on your app, is this. And the peace of God which transcends, goes beyond our ability to understand, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know what happens to me when I worry? When I worry, I start spinning stuff in my head. And then I get agitated, and I get anxious, and the problem gets bigger, and the issue gets more complicated, and I get more worn out and worn down. And here's what Paul is saying. When you are worrying, when you have stuff to be anxious about, pray, invite God in, give those to him, and the peace of God which goes beyond your ability to know how he does it will begin to guard the two things that matter most in how you're going to function today, which is your heart and your mind, what you think and what you're feeling. And God wants to guard that, protect that for us. Now, all of us worry. And do you realize how that happened? No, nobody is born worrying, right? You didn't, you didn't come out of the womb and you're laying there in the nursery going, man, I hope someone's coming to feed me because if I don't get fed, I'm going to be like in trouble in about an hour. (laughs) Right? We learn worry and we learn it one of two ways. We learn it, most of us, by experience. I mean, look around the room. Most of us in the room, there's enough miles on the tires. Now, you know that not everything is going to work out like you need it to work out. Not everything is going to go the way you want it to go. Not everything that you're hoping for is going to happen. That things are, that you're going to get a diagnosis. You're going to get a a, a job uh, layoff. You're you're going to get a relationship that comes about. You know by experience that stuff happens and sometimes it happens to you. And so by experience, you know, I should worry about this. And you've also learned to worry because it was modeled for you. 
Maybe for you, you, there was a parent or a coach or a significant adult in your life or maybe your first boss who was a worrier. I mean, they, they would like... You could just say they'd get anxious about things. They'd start talking about things. They'd, they'd, they'd paint scenarios. And I mean, you just, you watched it and you got it modeled for you. And you, anxious parents raise anxious kids. Addie and I were in line for one of the rides. And, and the mom uh, was in, that was in front of us with her little boy, <coughs> excuse me, was, um, she was starting to talk about like all the things that might be going wrong that day. Like, you know, were they going to be able to find their car when they got back out to the parking lot? And they were supposed to meet dad and the other, uh, one of the other uh, kids at, at some spot in the park. But what if they missed them there? And how long was this ride going to go? And after all, on the ride, what if the ride breaks down? What if we don't get on? What if you're too, too, too short? I mean, she was just going on with the list. I, I reached in and, and got 10 bucks out of my pocket and handed it to her and said, here's $10. And she said, what for? I said, because this kid's going to need therapy. And so I just want to help invest in the fun. <laughs> I didn't do that, but I really wanted to do that. <laughs> And worrying robs us. And you didn't get there because you were born with that ability. You got there because you know how life goes and you saw it modeled for you and it was the only thing you knew to do. So if you can, un, if you can learn something, you can unlearn it or you can learn something new. How do we deal with worry? Don't be anxious about anything, Paul says. Well, the reality is, worry is a real issue. Anxiety is a tough issue. The biblical word for worry or anxiety is actually the same word in the Greek, and, uh, and it's rooted to a word that means divided. In other words, what happens to us when we worry, when we get anxious? Our heart and our mind gets divided, doesn't it? We start laying in bed, and we start thinking about all, all the what ifs. What if this happened? What if that happens? What if that? And all of a sudden, now our, our attention gets divided. Our focus gets divided. We start hanging more of our energy and effort thinking about all the possibilities that could be terrible rather than inviting God in or looking for any way that this might turn out to be good, even if it doesn't go like we want it to go. And so for us, this worry is this divided heart and mind. And then here's what happens. We start creating scenarios that, that may or may not exist. And then we get more tired and we get anxious. And then we don't invest in our relationships that much. And then we start uh, making rash decisions. And then, and then we create even more trouble. And we get in this cycle that kind of starts spinning down on us. It creates pessimism and, and these impulsive things that we do. And our relationships get more clouded. And now we're getting a little further uh, in a hole and then pretty soon things are really bad for us do you know what happens when we start to worry and that gets deeper for us we throw hooks out and we start snagging other stuff we start worrying about things we never even knew we needed to worry about and and all of a sudden that load gets heavier and heavier and heavier and we get uh, more worn down and more worn down and our decisions get worse our relationships get worse the world gets darker for us and we begin to make even uh, worse decisions that take us in darker places worry doesn't do anything is there one thing in your life that's been resolved because you worried? Is there anything that it, it, you laid in bed and worried all night long about it, and the next morning, that thing just, it just because you were worrying, it, it, it got fixed? All it does is add weight to us. Here's what Solomon said. An anxious heart weighs a person down. And Jesus said... What are you worried about? Well, the stuff you're worried about tends to be all kind of the temporary stuff in life. It's all the big deal stuff to us. But it's all the stuff that, that isn't going to last forever. And when we get stuck in worrying about the temporary, all of a sudden it robs our day of any strength. Jesus' words, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own, Jesus said. Now sometimes what we need to do is that thing we're worrying about. Let's say you're worried about finances right now. If you're worried about finances, maybe one of the things you should do is actually take some practical steps. 
Quit spending. Get on a financial plan. Join one of our uh, crown or financial peace university classes to help you deal with that. You're not alone. A lot of us get stuck on finances. Or if there's a relationship problem going on, something in my marriage or something with one of my kids, and then maybe what I need to do is uh, listen to some podcasts to give me some encouragement around that or, or read something or maybe seek some counseling to help me get some tools uh, to, to resolve that issue. Jesus isn't saying, hey, listen, stuff's going to come up in life, and what I really want you to do is just sit on your hands. I don't want you to worry about it. I just want you to sit in a rocking chair, and, you know, God's got you. <laughs> That's not the invitation. The invitation is I ought to be leaning in where I can lean in. But Jesus is also saying this to us. When you are trying to just fix this on your own and you're not inviting me and you're not inviting God to the table, then you are going to be left with only one really resolvable way, one thing going on in your life, and that you're going to get anxious and you're going to worry. And I want you to know to trust me. Invite me in. Because worry only takes away our strength. It only adds to the weight we're carrying. And the stuff we're worrying about, is it real stuff? Like some of you are going to go and get in your car in just a few minutes and you're going to uh, get out on 66 and some of you are already worried about whether or not you're going to have to wait for a table at the restaurant. Is it real stuff to worry about? Worry doesn't change anything. doesn't change my past. The stuff that may have got me to this spot doesn't change my future, and it only clouds my present. And so am I inviting God in? Paul's words, but in everything. And that means everything. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and that peace of God which transcends our understanding guards our hearts and our minds. And so God's inviting us to give him those things, to cast our cares on him. And what can we do? One of the first things I can do, and it's not the first thing I go to naturally, even as long as I've been a Christ follower, is pray, is pray. God, I need your help on this. I don't see a path forward. Help me to trust this even if it doesn't go like I think it should go. Lord, give me some insight that I don't have right now. Bring some along who can help me that I don't know yet. Lord, give me some path forward in this. I don't want to do this on my own. And I don't want to get stuck in the vicious cycle where I'm just worrying and that worrying gets deeper or where I become more anxious and then maybe depressed. And now I'm, I'm bringing the worst of me to the table. Lord, keep me out of that cycle. God, help me with this thing. Eugene uh, Peterson in the message says uh, these words from Paul this way, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayer, letting God know your concerns. I love people say to me once in a while, I don't really know how to pray. And, and I'll say this, do you know how to worry? Because if you know how to worry, you know how to pray. <laughs> it's just taking those worries and instead of internalizing those, it's turning them back to God. It's taking those worries instead of creating scenarios that may not yet exist, and it's offering that to God. And it's inviting God to protect my mind and my heart, to guard that for me. But I know prayer can be hard sometimes because we think there's some like special formula to prayer. I was standing out in the lobby uh, a while back, and I had a guy uh, come out in the lobby and said, he said to me, I need a prayer. And I said, great, I'm happy to pray for you. And because uh, sometimes you'll see me, you know, someone will mention something going on and I'll just stop in the lobby and pray. And, and they said, I need a prayer. And I said, what can I pray for? And he said, I don't need you to pray for me. I need a prayer. I need you to write one down and give it to me. Well, that got my attention. I said, hey, what's going on? And he said, uh, well, yesterday I was at the in-between. The in-between is a transitional housing unit uh, down here in Longmont. And, and uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Our church has been involved down there for a long time, and, and uh, we have people who do some mentoring, counseling, and others who uh, do repairs. And this guy said, I just, start, I just started coming to church, and I, I, I uh, was helping put a water heater in this place. And it was Saturday morning, and 
and, and uh, came out at lunchtime, and some of the people in the home uh, that were living there uh, said, hey, do you go to church? And, and I said, I do. I go to LifeBridge. And he said, oh, man, that's great, because I need someone to pray for me right now. And this guy said, dude, I don't know how to pray, but I'll get one, and I'll come back. <laughs> and so now here he is the next morning asking me to write down a prayer. You know, if you know how to worry, you know how to pray. If you know how to sit and stew and let stuff get the best of you, keep you staring at the ceiling at night, if you know how to do that, you know how to take all those same scenarios, all those same words, all that same stuff that's rolling over and over through your head and turn that up to God. Because if you pray, if you pray, you may not have so much to worry about.